A Story Without a Title by Anton Chekhov In the fifth century, just as now, the sun rose every morning, and every evening retired to rest. In the morning, when the first rays kissed the dew, the earth revived, the air filled with the sounds of rapture and hope, while in the evening the same earth subsided into silence and plunged into gloomy darkness. One day was like another, one night like another. From time to time a storm cloud raced up, and there was the angry rumble of thunder, or a negligent star fell out of the sky, or a pale monk ran to tell the brotherhood that not far from the monastery he had seen a tiger. The monks worked and prayed, and their father superior played on the organ, made Latin verses, and wrote music. The wonderful old man possessed an extraordinary gift. He played on the organ with such art that even the oldest monks, whose hearing had grown somewhat dull towards the end of their lives, could not restrain their tears when the sounds of the organ floated from his cell. When anything, even the most ordinary things, for instance, of the trees, of the wild beasts, or of the sea, they would not listen to him without a smile or tears. And it seemed that the same chords vibrated in his soul as in the organ. His face flushed and his voice thundered. And as the monks listened to him, they felt that their souls were spellbound from his inspiration. At such marvelous splendidments, his power over them was boundless, and if he had bidden his elders fling themselves into the sea, they would all, every one of them, have hastened to carry out his wishes. His music, his voice, his poetry, in which he glorified God, the heavens, and the earth, were a continual source of joy monks. It sometimes happened that through the monotony of their lives they grew weary of the trees, the flowers, the spring, the autumn. Their ears were tired of the sound of the sea, and the song of the birds seemed tedious to them. But the talents of their father superior were as necessary to them as their daily bread. Dozens of years passed by, and every day was like every other day, every night was like every other night, except the birds and the wild beasts. Not one soul appeared near the monastery. The nearest human habitation was far away, and to reach it from the monastery, or to reach the monastery from it, meant a journey of over seventy miles across the desert. Only men who despised life, who had renounced it, and who came to the monastery as to the grave, ventured to cross the desert. What was the amazement of the monks, therefore, when one night there knocked at their gate, a man who turned out to be from the town, and the most ordinary sinner who loved life? Before saying his prayers and asking for the Father Superior's blessing, this man asked for wine and food. To the question how he had come from the town into the desert, he answered by a long story of hunting. He had gone out hunting, and had drunk too much, and lost his way. To the suggestion that he should enter the monastery, the monastery and save his soul, he replied with a smile, I am not a fit companion for you. When he had eaten and drunk, he looked at the monks who had served him, shook his head reproachfully, and said, You don't do anything, you monks. You are good for nothing but eating and drinking. Is that the way to save one's soul? Only think, while you sit here in peace, eat and drink, and dream of beatitude, your neighbors are perishing and going to hell. You should see what is going on in the town. Some are dying of hunger. Others, not knowing what to do with their gold, sink into profligacy and perish like flies struck in honey. There is no faith, no truth in men. Whose task is it to save them? Whose work is to preach to them? 
it is not for me, drunk from morning till night as I am. Can a meek spirit, a loving heart, and faith in God have been given to you for you to sit here within four walls doing nothing? The townsman's drunken words were insolent and unseemly, but they had a strange effect upon the Father Superior. The old man exchanged glances with the monks, turned pale, and said, My brothers, he speaks the truth, you know. Indeed, poor people in their weakness and lack of understanding are perishing in vice and infidelity, while we do not move, as though it did not concern us. Why should I not go and remind them of the Christ whom they have forgotten? The townsman's words had carried the old man away. The next day he took his staff, said farewell to the brotherhood, and set off for the town. And the monks were left without music, without his speeches and verses. They spent a month drearily, then a second, but the old man did not come back. At last, after three months had passed, the familiar tap of his staff was heard. The monks flew to meet him and showered questions upon him. But instead of being delighted to see them, he wept bitterly and did not utter a word. The monks noticed that he looked greatly aged and had grown thinner. His face looked exhausted and wore an expression of profound sadness, and when he wept he had the air of a man who had been outraged. The monks fell into weeping too, and began with sympathy asking him why he was weeping, why his face was so gloomy. But he locked himself in his cell without uttering a word. For seven days he sat in his cell, eating and drinking nothing, weeping and not playing on his organ. To knocking at his door and the entreaties of the monks to come out and share his grief with them, he replied with unbroken silence. At last he came out, gathering all the monks around him, with a tear-stained face and with an expression of grief and indignation, and telling them of what had befallen him during those three months. His voice was calm, and his eyes were smiling when he described his journey from the monastery to the town. On the road, he told them, the birds sang to him, the brooks gurgled, and sweet youthful hopes agitated his soul. He marched on and felt like a soldier going to battle and confident of victory. He walked on dreaming and composed poems and hymns and reached the end of his journey without noticing it. But his voice quivered, his eyes flashed, and he was full of wrath when he came to speak of the town and of the men in it. Never in his life had he seen or even dared to imagine what he met with when he went into the town. Only then, for the first time in his life, in his old age, he saw and understood how powerful was the devil, how fair was the evil, and how weak and hearted and worthless were men. By an unhappy chance, the first dwelling he entered was the abode of vice, some fifty men in possession of much money were eating and drinking wine beyond measure. Intoxicated by the wine, they sang songs and boldly uttered terrible revolting words such as a God-fearing man could not bring himself to pronounce. Boundlessly free, self-confident and happy, they feared neither God nor the devil, nor death, but said and did what they liked and went whither their lust led. And the wine, clear as amber, flecked with sparks of gold, must have been irresistibly sweet and fragrant, for each man who drank it smiled blissfully and wanted to drink more. To the smile of man, it responded with a smile and sparkled joyfully when they drank it, as though it knew the devilish charm it kept hidden in its sweetness. The old man, growing more and more incensed and weeping with wrath, went on to describe what he had seen. 
On a table in the midst of the revellers, he said, stood a sinful, half-naked woman. woman. It was hard to imagine, or to find in nature anything more lovely and fascinating. This reptile, young, long-haired, dark-skinned, with black eyes and full lips, shameless and insolent, showed her snow-white teeth and smiled as though to say, Look how shameless, how beautiful I am. Silken brocade fell in lovely folds from her shoulders, but her beauty hid itself under her clothes, but eagerly thrust itself through the folds, like the young grass through the ground in spring. The shameless woman drank wine, sang songs, and abandoned herself to anyone who wanted her. Then the old man, wrathfully brandishing his arms, described the horse races, the bullfights, the theatres, the artist's studios where they painted naked women or modeled them of clay. He spoke with inspiration, with sonorous beauty, as though he were playing on unseen chords, while the monks, petrified, greedily drank in his words and gasped with rapture. After describing all the charms of the devil, the beauty of evil, and the fascinating grace of the dreadful female form, the old man cursed the devil, turned and shut himself up in his cell. When he came out of his cell in the morning, there was not a monk left in, left in the monastery. They had all fled to the town. Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Davis Drake